Welcome, and thank you for listening to Sandy Creek Stirrings. I'm your host, Joshua Jimenez. And if you're going to win souls, you've got to love souls. In spite of their meanness, in spite of the way they look, in spite of everything, you've got to seek to bring souls to Jesus Christ because you love them, because Jesus loved them, and because Jesus died for them, and you're trying to bring them to the Son of God. The Bible says in Psalm 84, 11, my last verse, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. I based my whole life on that, that it pays to serve God, and I believe that law of my heart. God has given us a guidebook. God has given us a directional map, and that guidebook, that map, is the precious Word of God. Listen, don't just go and sit in the pew. Find some way to serve and serve as a family. Be a part of everything at church, and when you learn to love what God loves, um, your children will learn to love it as well. Homes are not that spiritually strong. We're getting overtaken by the world quickly, but unfortunately, we're pumping all the sewage in. You know, we're letting the world in when that ought to be a haven. Well, we just finished up our four-part series on making the Bible version debate simple, starting in episode number 244, then 245, 246, and 247. We just finished up that series, updating a a series uh, on Bible versions that we had done quite a while ago early on in the podcast and wanted to update and renew that series. And so I pray and hope that it was a blessing to you. I wanted to give a shout out to Pastor Moss who emailed me in there in Texas and a retired firefighter but has been pastoring for the past 15 years. And so I wanted to give a shout out to him. Thank you for sending in that email of encouragement. Also asked to have access to the PDF book that I mentioned in the last episode, Making the Bible Version Debate Simple. And basically I took all four of those parts that I've done in episodes in basically audio format and I put them into um, book format, I guess you would say. I took my notes, put them in book format so you can read it. And it's about 46 pages long. The entire document is 50 pages if you count the front cover, back cover, and a couple of miscellaneous pages in there. But uh, reading is 46 pages. It's got margins all the way around. And so not that long of a read. You could probably read through the entire thing in an hour. Um, if you're slow, maybe two hours, but it won't take long to read through. If you're interested in getting that PDF book. It's free. There's absolutely no copyright. You can do whatever you want with it. But if you're interested in getting that like Pastor Moss in Texas was, then you can email me, joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. Again, my email is joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. So I send an email off to him. I'll send one off to you as well if you so desire one of those books. Again, just email me, joshua at sandycreekstirrings.com. You say, well, Brother Josh, now that we've finished up the Bible version debate, what are we getting into today? Well, you saw the title of the episode, You Know That We're Not Out of the Water Yet. And uh, we're kind of sticking with that theme on the Bible versions, really on the KJV today is what we're going to talk about for a little bit. I do have a... a um, an episode that I'm looking forward to putting out next week. In fact, my wife and I, a Sunday night after church, spent some of the evening just stayed up kind of late talking about that episode, and I was going over some of my thoughts that I wanted to share with you in that episode. And that won't be this episode. That'll be next week, which will be episode number, I think, 249 is where we're at. Wow. 250 episodes of Sandy Creek Stirrings. It's incredible. But um, 248 today, next week will be 249. I'm excited about that episode um, because it's an update episode to an episode we've done in the past, and I don't want to sound overly confusing, but when I produce next week's episode, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about, and I hope and pray that it'll be a blessing to you. I'm kind of excited to share it with you. Uh, kind of nervous at the same time. I don't know if nervous is the proper term, but I'm just excited to be able to put out that episode, something that's been on my heart and something that I wanted to share with you. Now, for today, I wanted to answer some common objections to the KJV, kind of a follow-up to last week, where in Making the Bible Version Debate Simple Part 4, we talked about how to defend the KJV, and we talked about answering some of the most common questions um, that people will, or common objections, I guess would be a better term, that people have 
against the KJV, for instance. It's full of old words. Um, it's full of contradictions. The translators uh, weren't, weren't perfect men. They were normal men. Um, and we talked about those three main critiques that I hear about the KJV. But as I sat there and I was recording that episode, I thought of so many other things that I wanted to talk about. But if you listen to the last episode, you know how long that episode was. By the time we did the intro and the outro, we had an hour and two minutes on that episode. And so I didn't want to make it any longer. So I thought, let's add a follow-up answering some very common questions that I hear as well in regards to the KJV. If you are talking with someone about the King James Bible, or you are believing or of the belief that you should be King James only, these are questions at some point in time you will be asked, you will be faced with. And so I kind of wanted to give you a little bit of a rundown today on what I typically do with some of these questions that I'm asked. For instance, um, let's let's dive right in. I'm not going to take a whole lot of time to do anything else today, but um, but let's dive right into the topic. All right, here's, here's a question that I commonly get asked. You will too, if you are in this thing long enough, all right? People will ask me, Brother Josh, do you believe, or if they don't like me, they just call me whatever they want. Uh, but you, you get somebody that say, hey, Josh, is the King James Version, do you believe that it is inspired? Now, most of the time when somebody is asking me that, they don't necessarily mean, do I believe the words are inspired? They more mean along the lines, do I believe that the King James translators themselves, those men we talked about in the episode last week, do I believe the King James translators were inspired themselves? Like, were they inspired? And really, it deals with this topic, which has now been termed as double inspiration. Do I believe that Scripture was inspired twice? Because there are some people who believe that Scripture was inspired in the Greek and the Hebrew, and then there are people who believe that it was inspired again in 1611. Uh, one person who has given thoughts that are similar to um, to that, like the KJV was inspired in 1611. Um, somebody like Gail Ripplinger was big in promoting that idea of inspiration in 1611, and that the KJV, the translators, were inspired. If you read some of her comments and some of her work, you would get some of that out of that. And the question at least to me, is getting posed more frequently and frequently as time goes on. In fact, somebody not too long ago asked me that question. And so do I believe in double inspiration? Do I believe the King James translators themselves were inspired? And I want to give you my answer, and I do not believe this to be a personal answer. I believe this to be a biblical one. So as far as double inspiration, as far as the KJV being inspired, let me give you an answer. Let's go back to the beginning for a second. Inspiration, if we go back to what the definition is, inspiration means, in the simplest of terms, God breathed. So when Paul wrote the book of Romans, or Peter wrote the book of 1 Peter, or um, John wrote the book of Revelation, when these guys wrote the Bible, they weren't writing what they thought or what they, should, they thought they should put down or their opinion. They were writing what God breathed to them, what God gave them. They were the very words of God. That's why, of course, we call it the Word of God. It's, it's not the Word of men, it's the Word of God. Then that's what inspiration is. Inspiration means God breathed. Theos nustos is the Greek word, and I'm probably not even pronouncing it right, but God breathed. God gave them the words. So when we take that definition, and somebody asks me, do I believe the King James translators were inspired? Well, the answer is no. And there are going to be some out there who say, Oh no, Brother Josh has fallen off the deep end. Uh, no, not necessarily. Hear me out for a second. Go back to the definition and go back to the basics. If the King James translators were inspired, then they could have sat down with a blank sheet of paper and a pen and have been able to write out Scripture into English without even having to look at the originals, 
without even having to go back. And remember the process we talked about last time. We're not going to discuss it today. If you missed it, go back and and listen to the last episode, part number four. But that process they went through of the different groups looking at it, and some of these some of these passages being um, looked at a minimum of I think it's a minimum of thirteen times, up to fifteen and seventeen times these passages were examined. There would be no need for that if they were inspired, because they could have sat down and written everything out, and they didn't even need to look at the Hebrew and Greek. They didn't even need to look at the traditional text. They didn't need to consult anything, because that is what true inspiration is. Paul, when he wrote, he didn't have to look at any other sources. God gave him the words, and he penned them down. That's true inspiration. And so were the King James translators inspired? No, they were not inspired. And so for people who believe that the Word of God was inspired in 1611, they've got a major issue because that's simply not what it was. It was not inspiration, and the Bible was not inspired in 1611. Anybody who says that, anybody who says that, scholar or whatever it may be, anybody who says the King James Bible was translated in 1611, I ask you this then why are you using the 1769 KJV? And you say, what are you talking about? Well, the 1611 is when the King James Version was completed through the authorization of King James. But it went through a series of revisions. Um, it wasn't changes. It was more updated, updated spelling and things of that sort. They went through and revised it. Not not the revised standard version, but they went through and revised it, updated the spelling, and went through and made sure everything that was right. And so when you and I pick, a, pick up a KJV today, we're using a 1769, not a 1611. All right, so we have some major issues if somebody says, well, it was inspired in 1611. No, it was not. That doesn't even meet the definition of 1611. Now, hang on before you shut me off. You might be thinking, well, you, so you don't believe the King James Bible is inspired? Well, let me give me a second to answer on that. While I do not believe, and I don't think we can believe, that the King James translators were inspired, I do believe that they were led of God to produce the King James Version, and I believe that he guided these men through the process for what his purpose was. And you say, well, what was God's purpose? That purpose uh, was being, was to produce a translation of, of God's Word into English that is perfect and pure without any errors or contradictions. So while I don't believe that they were necessarily inspired in the way that inspired means within Scripture, I do believe that God led them and God aided them. I mean, you look at even just the putting together of this group of scholars. It was the greatest group of men, scholars, translators to ever come across the scene in history. It's a marvel that even all of these men were able to be put together for this task. And so really, when we get asked this question, double inspiration, do you believe, blah, blah, blah. The reason I believe, well, let me say this, I believe it's a matter of terminology. And the reason I believe that it's a matter of terminology rather than theology is because preservation and inspiration are two different things. Yet so many people out in the world want to lump them together as one and the same. We want to lump together inspiration and preservation, call it the same thing, and throw it out. No, that's not the case. Preservation, which is an act of God, we talked about this in Making the Bible Version Debate Simple, uh, part one. Go back and listen to it. But God took and he inspired the words, and then he promised he would preserve them. They're two different processes. They're two different things. God said he inspired his words, and he promised he would preserve them. Two separate things right there. One's inspiration, one's preservation. And if the King James translators, if they took the inspired words of God and through translation preserve them, we would classify the preserved words as inspired. Now, we've got kind of a little, kind of a little issue because if I, if I pose the question to you and say, would we classify it as inspired if we preserve the words? And I'm getting a little technical here, so hang on with me. But if I pose that question, some people are going to have an issue because if I say, yes, the preserved words are inspired, 
then naturally people, after listening to this, are going to say, well, Brother Josh believes in double inspiration. That's not the case. But if I say, no, the preserved words are not inspired, we have a different issue. To preserve something means to keep something in its state, right? It's preserving it. So the preserved words, put it this way, if I went and I started planting fields and fields and fields and fields and fields of green beans, and I'm going to be the next green giant. I mean, I'm going to be the green bean guy of the United States. And one of my selling factors are that my green beans are hand-picked. No machines, nothing like that. I mean, everything is done by hand. They are hand-picked green beans. And I'm going to put that on the side of the can. Well, when I can, when I pick those green beans, and then I can them, what is canning them? What is that? It's preserving them, right? It's preserving them so people can go on to, uh, into Walmart, they can go on the shelf, they can grab a can of the green beans, and they're not going to die because the green beans have been preserved so you can eat them at a later date. They are preserved. Let me ask you a question, though. If I had a sticker across the can that said, Han picked in, I don't know, pick a state, handpicked in Florida. Would that be a lie? No, it wouldn't be, because it doesn't matter. I preserved handpicked green beans, right? So they're still handpicked the same way. If we take the inspired words of God and we preserve them, well, God does the act of preserving them and through his means and through his methods. If God preserves them, then what are they? They are preserved, inspired, words. So the preserved words would have to be inspired if we followed the definition of preservation and God's promise of it. So do I believe in double inspiration? No. Here's what I believe, and here's what I believe we see biblically through Scripture and what we see historically as well. I believe God inspired His words and then preserved them through the process of translation in the King James Bible. Let me say that for you again. I believe God inspired his words and then preserved them through the process of translation into the King James Bible. In essence, do I believe the King James Bible is inspired? Yes, I do. Do I believe it was inspired again in 1611? No, I believe it is a, pre a preservation of the originally inspired words. God promised he would preserve his inspired word, and so I believe in one inspiration, yet still one preservation. So I hope that makes sense to you. This is a question I get fairly often. Number two, I want to go over this idea of what about italicized words? What about italicized words? What about words in italics? You've, if you've read your Bible, which hopefully you have, right? There's no need to debate the Bible, uh, Bible versions if you don't even read it. Uh, but here we go. You look in, in the Bible and you begin reading it and you see italicized words. It's all throughout. There's italicized words every there everywhere. And people ask, what are those for? And those italicized words are there just for clarification. Whenever you translate from one language into another, you have to understand how translation works. Okay, when talking about Bible translation, you have to understand, let's take it down to the basics. And I know you know this, you're a smart person. But English and Greek are two completely different languages, right? They use completely different words. They use completely different uh, structure and sentences. They use completely different letters. They're completely different languages. They are not the same. They are different languages. And so when you look at the Greek, sometimes, sometimes you'll have one Greek word that takes two, three, even four English words to mean the same thing. Let me give you an example, okay? So you and I are friends. You know me. I know you. You speak a little French, but you know that I only speak French. That's my only language. And so you and another friend are walking down through the woods one day. There's a creek there. And all of a sudden, you see me sitting on the bank of the river, and I'm kind of working on something in my lap, kind of kind of got a basket next to me, and I'm work there's something in my hands I'm working on. And you and your friend come by, and you say, bonjour, and I say, bonjour, and you ask me how I'm doing, and then you say, in French, you say, what are you doing? And I look at you, 
And since I only know French, I respond in French, and I say, je pêche. Now, you know a little bit of French, so you know what I'm saying, but your friend, he only speaks English. And so your friend says, what did he say he's doing? And you look to tell your friend, you're going to translate for him what I said. And, well, here's something you need to realize. The literal translation from French into English of je pêche, the literal translation, if I translate it exactly how it's written, is I fish. That's, that's literally what it means in English. I fish. But you wouldn't look at your friend and say, he said, I fish. No, 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 no. You would use proper grammar within English, which would require you to say, which would naturally say, he said, I am fishing. Right? Because that's what I said in French, just in English it comes out slightly differently based on the grammar structure of the sentence. So the question is, are you adding to my words when you translate for your friend? No, you're not, because you're saying in English exactly what I said in French, put grammatically correct within English. Take this for example. I love you in French is je t'aime. I love you in French is je t'aime. The literal English translation of je t'aime, right? If I were just to translate exactly how it's written, which is not how you do translation ever. Nobody translate, translate like the, translates like this anywhere, anytime, because it's not correct. But if I were to translate literally word for word exactly how it's said in French, je t'aime, it literally says, I, you, love. You say, that's weird. Right, it's English, but in French, it's completely normal because that's how they structure things. Je t'aime. I, you, love. But if, if my wife and I said, je t'aime, and she, I, I was speaking in French, and she was translating into English, and she said, oh, you said, I, you, love. No, that would make no sense, right? Because that makes no sense in English because that's not how we structure our sentences. So if my wife wanted to properly translate what I said into English, she would say, he said, I love you. That's the proper translation. And that's exactly what the italicized words are. And here's the deal. The translators of the KJV were honest and right. When they put the words in italics, because they were telling you these words were added to give the proper meaning of what the Greek word says. Not that they were added to the text, not that these are added words to the Bible, but meaning if these words were added, it would not be grammatically correct, because this is the proper translation of that Greek word. Without it, it would be improper. Can you imagine a translation um, from French into English that said things like, I you love, or I fish? Those would not, that wouldn't be normal English. That wouldn't be right. Those would not be proper translations. And so that's what the italics are there for. They're words that are added in, per se, to make sure that you get the proper English translation. Here's a third question I get fairly often Wasn't King James a homosexual? Wasn't King James a homosexual? I had at one time a former co worker who was a Jehovah Witness and he had left his job, but he called me up one day and he said, hey, I have a bunch of different English translations of the Bible. I've got a whole bunch of them, a whole collection, and I want to give them to you. And I politely said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. I only use the King James. And he responded over the phone. He said, why? That's the worst one. You know King James is a homosexual, right? And my... my for a second there, I got caught because I didn't know. I I never heard this thing about King James being a homosexual. That had never brought to my attention before. I never even heard that before. But the more that I've been in this thing, the more I realize this is a common thing people bring up. You shouldn't trust the King James Version because King James was a homosexual. Well, here's here's the answer. My first answer is, number one, what does that have to do with anything? You know, sometimes we get talking to people about different things, whether it be Bible versions or anything in Christianity, and somebody will say something. And you know, if we would just stop and think about it, we could basically say, what does that have to do with anything? 
because King James had absolutely nothing to do with the actual translation of the Bible. He just authorized it. He gave permission for it to be put in print. That's it. That's all. So really, it has nothing to do with the KJV. Here's the deal. Take the logic of somebody who says, King James was a homosexual, so you shouldn't use the KJV. Okay, so there's the logic that because somebody did something that was right, right? What he was doing was a good thing. He was authorizing, giving them permission to translate the Bible into the vernacular, the common language of the people. That's a good thing. But we don't accept the good thing. This is the logic. We don't accept the good thing because the guy behind it is wicked. That's the logic. Let me put it here. That's like within Scripture. Remember the book of Ezra? King Cyrus, who was prophesied by Isaiah that he would come along hundreds of years before Cyrus was even born, he was named by name that he would come along and allow the children of Israel to rebuild the temple. An incredible prophecy was fulfilled when Cyrus came on the scene, and he gave permission to the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. What would you think if there were some Jews there who said, We shouldn't do it because Cyrus is a wicked king. We shouldn't do it because Cyrus doesn't completely follow God. We shouldn't do it because Cyrus doesn't follow the law. You would say, you're a bunch of idiots. Why? Because that has nothing to do with anything. Cyrus gave the law to go back and build the temple at Jerusalem. Do it. It's a blessed thing. It's a good thing. I can take you back to a modern-day president. You know who I'm probably talking about. I can take you back to a modern-day president who honestly... I wish he would have at times just have, just have shut his mouth. Just, not, just don't say anything. Don't say anything. And some of the things he did and some of the things he said were absolutely wicked, were absolutely vile, right? But were there a lot of good things that we could take advantage of as American citizens? Yes, there were a lot of great things that happened during that time period, like um, the, the capital of Israel being recognized as Jerusalem instead of somewhere else. Those are all very good things. But we didn't reject them simply because the guy who allowed it to happen was a wicked man. In the same way, saying that King James is a homosexual has nothing to do with the Bible version debate and really should be thrown out right off the bat. But I do want to go a little bit deeper. The second answer I give to this, because typically somebody who says that, for one, it has nothing to do with the the actual Bible version debate. But secondly, they have no clue. Because King James was a man of high moral fiber and character. Take, for example, if you go back in history and study English history, you would learn quickly about a man by the name of Sir Edward Coke. Sir Edward Coke. He was basically what we might equate to being the head of our U.S. Supreme Court. He was a very, very important man, and he was a man who did not like King James. They dis- he despised King James. They were political enemies. I mean, he did not like King James. But if you go back and read Sir Edward Coke's writings, you'll find that he said King James had one of the highest moral, moral characters of any monarch to ever rule. Here's a guy who despised him. They were enemies. He did not like him. But he said, I'll tell you what, though, this guy has one of the highest moral characters of any monarch to ever live. Now hold that thought for a second, bring another thought into view. Something that Sir Edward Coke often wrote about and often attacked, he said it was one of the biggest blasphemies a man could commit. He wrote about it often, Sir Edward Coke despised homosexuality. Now bring both of those thoughts into view. Here's a guy who does not like King James, but says he is a guy of high moral character. And then on the other side, he says homosexuality is something to be despised. It's one of the biggest blasphemies a man could commit. You would think that if King James was a homosexual, Sir Edward Coke would have attacked him for it because he despised homosexuality, and he also despised King James. It would have been the perfect thing to bring together and despise the king about. But Sir Edward Coke never did that. Because truth be told, no one during King James' lifetime ever said or wrote anything along those lines claiming that he was a homosexual. You say, well, if that's the case, where did all this thought come from? I'm glad you asked. There was a guy who was part of King James' cabinet, 
right, cabinet being a group of advisors, not like, you know, his wooden cabinet over there by the wall. He's part of the cabinet. He's like the door, uh, you know, a cabinet being a group of, of advisors. His name was Anthony Weldon, and he was one of the advisors to King James. Anthony Weldon was caught doing something that he should not be doing. He was doing something wrong. And King James, being the guy of high moral character that he was, he kicked him out of his cabinet. He kicked him out from being one of his advisors. And from that day moving on, Anthony Weldon swore that he would get even with a king. So 25 years. Don't miss that. 25 years after King James' death. Anthony Weldon wrote a smearing expose stating that King James was a homosexual. Can I say, it's pretty easy to say that after someone has been dead for 25 years. It's just a smear job. I equate it to what some people have done over 100 years after the death of Abraham Lincoln. You say, what? Uh, There are some people who have come out over 100 years after Abraham Lincoln's death and wrote that he was a homosexual, or, or more specifically, they wrote that he was bisexual. It's pretty easy to attack a guy when he's dead. But the truth is, no one during Lincoln's time said that, wrote that, or even believed that. There's no historical evidence. There's no reason in history to point to Lincoln being a, a, a bisexual. I mean, you could look at his marriage, his children, a whole bunch of different things. There's no reason in the world. It's just, if, it's just a falsehood. It's just a, tr- a job, a, a defamation. It's just a smear job. That's all it is. It's just people trying to to destroy the moral character of Abraham Lincoln in history. That's all it is. And the same is true with what Anthony Weldon tried to do with King James. Now, there were two big things that Anthony Weldon did point to, saying that these were the reasons he was a homosexual. One was that King James never used any of his um, any of the money out of his mistress fund. You say, what is that? Well, within the English budget, whether you liked it or not, the king had certain amounts of money to be able, budgeted amounts of money, to be used for mistresses. Go back in history, typically if the king was married, his wife lived miles and miles and miles away from him, and the mistresses that he had dwelt in the castle or near the castle. And this was not true in the life of King James. Why, you say? because his wife lived with him in the castle. They had seven children together. He loved his wife. There is a book of love letters and poems that he wrote to his wife. You can go online and find it. Just love letters and notes and poems that he wrote to his wife. He talks about in those letters how he was in love with his wife. He talks about in those letters how he married her due to the prominence, right? Back then in the day, you would marry somebody not based on love, not based on attraction. You would marry them because of the influence they would gain you. They were from a prominent family or a wealthy family. And he admits in those letters, look, I married you for the wrong reasons to begin. But he says this, he says, but I have fallen in love with you. He loved his wife. King James was the only monarch to never use a penny from his mistress fund. And Weldon says that that was evidence he was a homosexual. I like the way my wife put it one time when I was talking to her about it. She said, no, that's proof that his wife lived with him in the castle. (laughs) And I think that's exactly right. The reason he didn't use any money was because his wife was in the castle. He would have been killed for it. And uh, so that's why, very clear answer. But go back and do some research actually on King James, a very fascinating guy. Um, the morality, the books he wrote, wrote many books on how to be a good king to his son. Go back and do some study on that. And secondly, Weldon stated that another reason to believe King James was a homosexual was that a man would sleep at night with King James in his bed. Why would that be? Well, if you go back and study the history of King James, the king, not the, not the Bible, but the actual king, King James, you would find that King James was kidnapped on multiple occasions with attempted assassinations happening six times. He was truly a hated man. And so in his room, they made a large, large bed. Uh, have you ever heard of a king-size mattress? You know where that idea came from? It's a bed large enough to sleep two people and they never have to touch because it's so big. And there was a bodyguard 
that would stand outside of the door where King James was sleeping. Every night, he would have a bodyguard outside of the door. They added on another protective measure on top of that, though. He would have another bodyguard who would sleep in his bed. Now, is that weird? Sure. I I agree. It's weird. But if you look at it this way, it was just a protective measure. Because if attackers got past the guard in the hall, then they would have to figure out which guy is King James and kill him before they were killed themselves. It was a protective measure. And that's all it was. When you go back and look at the history of the thing, sure, it's a little weird, but it makes perfect sense when you go back and study the life of King James. Then I want to give you one last thing, and we'll be finished up for today. Actually, two more. I want to give you a resource. Some have asked me about the Apocrypha. Why isn't it in the King James Bible? The Catholics have it in their Bible. Is it the inspired Word of God? I'm glad you asked that. And uh, go back to this and listen to episode number 120. Episode number 120, the Apocrypha, is it Scripture? I'm not going to take time to deal with that in this episode because we spent a whole episode discussing that topic. The Apocrypha, is it Scripture? Go back and take a look at that for yourself. And then the last one I want to talk about for just a second is, um, I'm trying to figure out, I, I don't have notes on this, so I'm just kind of coming off the top of my head with this. There has been a book that is put out and it's gaining some popularity amongst our independent Baptist. I hate to say movement because we're not a movement. The whole definition of our name is we're independent. But it's come out in our independent Baptist, can I say, circles. And it's gaining some popularity. Some guys who have stood for a long time for the King James Bible are beginning to turn away, not because of this book, but more so because they're looking just for a way out anyway. But this book, uh, some people have picked it up, and it's been a aid to them in finding excuses and reasons to be able to get out from being KJV only. And that book deals with the preface to the King James Bible version, um, the King James version of the Bible. It's in the preface that in a lot of King James Bibles, in my Bible, I've got a, I've got a Bible that I um, purchase that has the preface to the readers. It's got the translators, they wrote a letter to the reader of the King James Bible. And this guy goes through, and here, here's the deal. I don't. You'll find me. I don't typically throw names out a whole lot. If you've listened to Santa Creek Stirrings, we're almost at 250 episodes. I think guys within our movement, guys who would call themselves, and truth be told, this guy isn't even part of our movement. But um, I think if you were to listen to all the episodes, you would find guys that were in our movement. They were independent Baptists. Now, I'll call out the other guys all day. We've called out Rick Warren, John MacArthur, John Piper, uh, R.C. Sproul, uh, a bunch of Calvinists. We've called out a bunch of different people, right? But as far as independent Baptists, guys who would call themselves independent Baptists, we typically, we don't do that a whole lot. We're not here to attack necessarily. Um, But I think I will throw this guy's name out there just because I want you to be aware of it, and I'm not encouraging you in any way, shape, or form to go read his book, go listen to his podcast, or anything of that sort, but more to make you aware of, hey, this guy uh, can be dangerous, and let me give you a couple reasons why real quick, but the guy's name is Joshua Barzon. I guess is how you pronounce it. I really don't know. Joshua Barzon, he graduated from Fairhaven Baptist College, and they by no way endorse what he's now doing. I mean, he's now going um, going Reformed Baptist, so he's endorsing a lot of Calvinist doctrines as well. Go back and listen to our series on Calvinism, and that'll blow it out of the, ro- out of the water right there. But he put out a book going through the preface to the King James Version, the letter to the translators, and pulling out, I think it's 10 different things, if I remember correctly, and 10 different things from the the letter to the reader of the King James Version on what the translators said about the um, the King James Bible itself. And I've taken some time to do some research on that, and I've really found two kind of subjects that that whole book hinges on. The first one is it hinges on this idea that the King James translators, they never said the translation was perfect. That's the first one. All right, you can't believe the King James Bible because the translators themselves didn't believe it was perfect. And then the second thing that it kind of hinges on is this thought right here. The second thing is, I think this is very interesting. Listen closely. He takes a handful of preachers who have passed away and given their writings on why they believe you should not be King James only. 
And that's really, he, he's got some other things that really make no sense and have no application. When you go back and study the history of the translators themselves and their lives, it's pulling some things out of context. And we don't have time to, uh, this is not an expose of the book, and this is not going to go through and take every point. I just don't have time for that. And truth be told, it's a waste of time anyway. But those two points are kind of the things that this whole book, this whole guy and his theory hinges on. I want to give you something for a second. Number one, that thought that the translators didn't believe the Bible is perfect itself. And so that's why you shouldn't believe it, because the translators didn't believe the King James Bible was perfect. I'm pretty sure there is a Bible verse in Scripture. You tell me if it sounds familiar. Pride goeth before what? You know the verse. Pride goeth before what? Destruction. And a haughty spirit before a fall. Can I, can I just put this out there? If the KJV translators, who were common men, we've already talked about that, but their knowledge and a whole lot of other things, they were uncommon. I mean, these were the greatest group of scholars in Bible translation ever put together in history, and I doubt we'll ever have a group as great as they were in their knowledge of languages and all sorts of different things. But can you imagine these normal men coming out and say, yep, we did it. Yep, we made a perfect Bible. No issues, no errors, nothing wrong with it. I mean, you you try. You try and tear it apart, there is nothing wrong. We did it perfectly. Not a single issue, not a single error. Yep, look at us. Man, nobody else could do it, but we, we made a perfect Bible. Look at it. Wouldn't you kind of have a little bit of an issue with that? I think God would have an issue with that because he said, Pride goeth before destruction, and what? A haughty spirit before a fall. I would have a big issue if they came out and said it was perfect. God would have an issue with that. So for them to come out and say, ah, Well, you know, we're just, we're just ordinary men, and to go through some of the things they said, not stating that it was imperfect necessarily, but them believing themselves that they could do something perfect, they just didn't believe that was possible in and of themselves— That's the type of spirit you want them to have. I mean, was it not Paul, the Apostle Paul, right? We often call him the second greatest Christian, well, the greatest Christian to walk the earth, because uh, Jesus Christ, you know, we're following him, so Christ isn't the Christian, he's the Christ, right? And we could get into a whole topic about that, but the greatest Christian to ever walk the earth, many people say the Apostle Paul. This is the same guy who said, that which I should not do, I do, and that which I, sh- um, I should do, I do not. That's paraphrasing it. And you're like, what translation are you reading? I'm just, I'm just paraphrasing, y'all, just paraphrasing. And uh, but he said, you know, th- there's some things I should do, I don't do them, and there's some things that I should not do, I do those. What was he saying? He's saying I was a sinner. Paul didn't believe that he himself was perfect. And I appreciate these guys coming out and saying, what they said. Because if they came out with a haughty spirit, that would tell me that God could not bless their work. If they came out with a prideful spirit, that would tell me that God could not bless their work. But if you found some men who were scholars among scholars, I mean, these would be guys who nowadays, they would be traveling around to colleges doing Q&A sessions and giving, and giving long, lengthy discussions and giving long, lengthy answers on certain topics of this world. I mean, these were the scholars of scholars. There was nobody in history, and I doubt anybody will ever come, who have the knowledge that these guys had in one room. These guys were incredible. And for every human, human reason speaking, they could have come out and they could have had the most prideful and arrogant spirits you, you might imagine but they didn't. And that means that God could take this group of scholars with the knowledge that he gave them and be able to bless them in their work. So to say that, well, the King James Bible, the King James Bible translators, they didn't believe they were, they were perfect. Good. That's a good thing. That works in my favor, not the other side right? That argument, if people were smart, they would never bring that up because it does not work for the other side. Based on the Bible, based on Proverbs 16, 18, it works for me much more than it works for you. And then the second thing, this is something I mentioned earlier in this episode, where somebody will say something and we kind of stop and we're kind of like deer in the headlights. And remember I said, if you just stop and think about it for a second, you'll say, what in the world does that have to do with anything? In his book, he brings out this idea and writes and quotes men and preachers who have passed away, who, who yeah, they are highly respected. 
And he brings out their notes and says, well, look at what this guy said about being KJV only. And you shouldn't be KJV only because what did this guy says? And this guy says you shouldn't be KJV only. Can you stop and think for a second? What does that have to do with anything? I mean, I could take you to preachers who have passed away who are just as highly respected and say the same thing from the opposite side of the aisle. I mean, I could give you quote after quote after quote after quote after quote after quote after quote of men of God who have passed away who were highly respected and said that you should only use the King James Bible. What difference does that make? That does nothing for your side. That makes no difference whatsoever. Just because you have some guys who say we shouldn't be, I have some guys who say we should be, that does not matter. And here's the point I want to make, and here's why I would even bring this up, because I wanted to finish with this. We have begun to raise a generation of preachers and men who, starting in their mid-40s, late-40s, and moving down to early-20s like me, we have guys who think about this, who have begun to take and make the Bible translation debate about, well, this older preacher said this, or, or you know, the King James Bible translator said this, or, you know, King James was a homosexual, or, you know, uh, you know, I wish we just had modern English, and blah, 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 blah. But they don't ever talk about the issues within the critical text. They don't ever talk about why the traditional text was traditionally used by the early churches for translation purposes. They don't ever talk about how Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, which make up 98% of the critical text, have over three hours between just the two copies themselves and just the four Gospels alone. They never talk about the theology of Westcott and Hort, who, who helped to take the critical text and put it in mass production. They never talk about these things. All they want to talk about are straw men. Nothing more than distractions. And if the best they can do is go on podcast and talk about how we need to make sure that our English is up to date, and the best they can do is put out books based on a letter to the readers, if that's the best they can do, my friend, we have better things to talk about and better things to do with our time than to discuss straw men that are nothing more from the distraction because nothing more than distractions because here's the deal. The truth of the issue lies in the foundational issue that we discussed in part two of this uh, of this series, making the Bible version debate simple. Part number two. Again, if you missed it, that was episode number, and I'm going through my episode list, episode number 245, the foundational issue. These guys don't talk about it. Why? And let me back up for a little bit. I don't want to broad brush every guy out there who may not be KJV only. There may be some guys who who talk about it, but the guys that I've mentioned in this podcast series, they don't talk about it because they've missed it. Because there is a foundational issue that's deeper than whether or not, and he wasn't, whether or not King James was a homosexual, deeper than italicized words, deeper than old words in the English language, deeper than whether or not we can understand, which we can. We talked about that in the last episode, 247. Deeper than uh, what the translator said. Deeper than all these things is the foundational issue. What is your Bible based on? What's it built on? Is it a sure foundation? Is it something that can actually support a house and let it stand when the winds come and the the rains beat down? And that's what it really comes down to. What are you building on? What are you building on? It's so much deeper than he said, she said, or this book or that book. What are you building on? God was very clear when he said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And truth be told, I almost hate putting out an episode like this and almost hate mentioning names or mentioning books because I don't want to encourage anybody to research it out for themselves because I would just rather say, poison, 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 stay away. But God was so wise as only God could be when he very clearly said, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We can sit here all day with the right word of God and look at guys who don't care about the foundation, and their foundation is destroyed. 
They're, they want to use something that has errors and flaws in it. And truth be told, what can the righteous do? Because most of the time, I'm not going to change the authors or the podcasters or the pastors who want to change churches that were KJV only to something else and transition them. Most often, we're not going to change them because their foundation's been destroyed. So what can I do? I'll tell you what we can do. We can go out, we can take the Word of God, and we can win souls for Jesus Christ. That's what we can do. We can go and we can take those souls and we can disciple them and teach them corrupt. Uh, we can teach them doctrine that is uncorrupt. I just tried to combine the two words, un uncur doctrine, and uh, but doctrine that is uncorrupt, which Paul commanded Timothy to teach. He commanded him to teach doctrine that is uncorrupt, not having a spot, not having an issue. We can take those souls that have been saved those souls that have been discipled, and turn them back around and get them back out to reach others in the world and change lives all across the world, because Jesus is coming back. We need to stop wasting so much time discussing what this person said or what this podcaster said or what about this book or what about that and what about this debate and make sure you go listen to so-and-so. I mean, what does it matter? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? There's nothing we can do in regards to them. We just have to go back, get back to the basics, and keep the main thing the main thing. My friend, read the Word of God, heed the Word of God, share the Word of God. And if you do, I believe God will bless you because of it. And until next time, keep looking up and keep stirred up for the cause of Christ.